I was listening to something this morning that I thought was really interesting. It was a podcast, and uh, this theology professor at a college was talking about what's wrong with Gen Z. I'm I'm in. (laughs) I know. I I was like, okay, I would like to know too. Um, And she was talking about how they would have this gathering, excuse me, of students um, every year. And a professor would come in and pose this question. He said, if you were an ambassador from the future, what what issues would you bring that we need to be aware of? And and in like previous classes, every like everybody would be buzzing. They would say, Oh, I want to talk about climate change, or oh, I would want to talk about infrastructure and how we're gonna, you know, like what the economy is gonna be like. Mm-hmm. And with this specific class of kids, um, like this these incoming freshmen, it was quiet. No one was talking. Maybe like a little bit of murmuring in the like mm. in the classroom, but nothing. And so she realized something was going on with these students. Why could they not think about the future? Mm. And uh, she gets into the classroom. She poses the question again, and she realizes that all of them are talking about things that are happening to them here and now. Mm. So they're talking about the tornado that struck their home, or they're talking about the COVID vaccine. And she's like, I'm not asking you to talk about what's happening to you here and now. I'm talking to you about what's going to happen in the future. Can you look ahead and see where you would want to help or where you would want to make things better? And none of them could. Mm. And so... Isn't that interesting? Well, I think I feel like I relate to them because my answer to that question is, I mean, how could I possibly know? What do I? What, what, that seems like I don't understand the. I mean, I guess I understand the exercise. I don't know how yeah. one could answer such a thing. I I don't think that it's necessarily that you would have the right answer. I think it's just can your brain go there? Mm, can you no. think in that way? <laughs> it's not the way my mind yeah, works. Yeah, the same problem that Jen. I know. Has. Apparently, I do. I don't have um, a view of the future. Her, I live very much in the present. So, and I think that that's good. Well, um, but for so. for Gen Z, they're living in the present because. Um, hmm. What she said is they live in a, a trauma-exposed world. So not necessarily that they themselves have necessarily experienced it, but hmm. it's what they're seeing online. Hmm. Um, it's constantly like it's the 24-7 news cycle hmm. that is keeping them in this present moment, but it's not a hmm. healthy thing. Hmm. It's actually... Like they're they're struggling hmm. to think about a future that's not going to be um, unstable for them. Hmm. So when they go to college, they don't think, "What do I want to be when I grow up?" They are thinking more in terms of how can I make enough money for my family to survive. Hmm. So I thought, in light, that sounds uh, like a good question. <laughs> you know, yeah. But I mean, if I think about my gender, <laughs> think about my That's generation. That's what I would be thinking. Yeah, I need uh, a job. as a millennial. Sure. When I went to college, I was thinking, "What do I want to be when I grow up?" I wasn't necessarily mm. thinking about fearful around if I was going to make enough money. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So um, it makes me think about this weekend's sermon. Okay. Quite a bit. Yeah. Because you were talking a lot about the future mm-hmm. and the way that we view the present. In light of the future. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, and what what would you say to somebody who's having a hard time getting out of the trauma or the fear or the anxiety of this present moment? Yeah. Um, yeah. And needs to look ahead. Well, I mean, a, a couple things. One, I think, I think what Revelation provides in some sense is a fixed point that the future is fixed. And so so why that's comforting is because because it means you can't, not just you, but mankind can't derail the ultimate plan of God, that it will come to pass, which is which is really comforting because otherwise, you know, we'd be living with this kind of, I don't know, existential angst that somehow we're 
messing things up to such a degree it will be irreparable and we can't we can't repair everything i mean and, and, and you see some of that particularly around like climate change is a big is a big topic of conversation not one that i'm terribly interested in but i you know you see the the reactions to it mm-hmm. of people uh, young people particularly the fear that you know what will life be like one day in the future are we ruining the planet for you know future generations and all this kind of stuff and and you know not to dive down into that rabbit hole but i, I mean for me at least what revelation does is it, it gives me a fixed point in the future that i know i know in some sense how how the story is going to end the second thing though i think is important about all that is that it it, it allows me to kind of release um, the things that I'm not responsible for. Mm. And I think I think a lot of people live their lives um, carrying burdens that just aren't theirs to carry. I think we've mm-hmm. talked about this before, but it's the it's the ability to 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 take responsibility for the things you can take responsibility for. And I think this is maturity, right? Like if you wanted to define maturity, this probably isn't the sole definition, but I think it would have to be included is that it would look something like taking responsibility for what you're responsible for and not worrying about the things you're not responsible for. Mm-hmm. And that would give you kind of a, a clear sense of of where you end and where other people begin. Um, but as it stands, we're often enmeshed in all sorts of other people's business and and even God's business, things that aren't ours to worry about. So, uh, you know, what I think Revelation does, it gives me a picture of the future where where I can, hopefully it it presents or uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, surfaces, that's the word I'm looking for, Um, some some urgency and responsibility toward living my life with maybe a greater sense of purpose and not just living for pleasure and for comfort, Mm -hmm. Um, but also knowing that, that that the Lord is doing something and that that what he wants to do will happen. The best example of this, I think, comes from Gary. Your um what what, what how how would you relate to what what you, do you call Gary? Your college he professor. He was my something? seminary was, professor. There yeah. you go. The 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 cruise ship, I've mm-hmm, used this before, mm-hmm. but the idea of the, you know, a bunch of people on the cruise ship. The people on the cruise ship can kind of mill about, do what they want, go here, go there, but the ship is going where the ship is going. It's a good, mm-hmm. a good uh, way to to picture sort of the future is that there's both a free will and a fixed, a fixed, you know, I don't know what it is, destination mm-hmm. that it will arrive at. And so, yeah, I think yeah. I think Revelation gives us some vision of that fixed destination. Yeah, and to even go a little bit deeper into Revelation 19, if you take that cruise ship analogy to the next step, there is a mutiny on the cruise ship. Yeah. And so some people yeah, joined yeah. the side of the mutineers. Yeah, maybe, sure. <laughs> and then there's some people who stayed on the side of the captain mm-hmm. who's directing the cu- cruise ship. And so... Yes, you can do kind of whatever you want on the cruise ship, but ultimately you would have to choose a side. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we see in Revelation 19. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. The ship is like nearly to its destination. Mm. Um, but what's right. surprising about the battle that we see in Revelation 19 is that it's kind of anticlimactic, sure. I guess. Would, is that how you would describe it? Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at Revelation 19, that's the one interesting thing about it. It's the Battle of Armageddon. I mean, mm-hmm. we have a movie mm-hmm. called Armageddon, which is, you know, I mean, it's meant to be like the end of everything. Like, it's this big, you know, climactic finale. But Revelation 19 really doesn't have that kind of climactic finale. I think in one of the services I said, if this was a movie, you'd be really disappointed. It mm-hmm. just ends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And there's really no battle of Armageddon. It's just the the beast or the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire alive, and then everyone else there is slain by the sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, the one sitting on the horse. Um, yeah, so there's really not much of a battle. It just it's sort of over really quickly. Um, yeah, and I I think what's interesting about that one of the things I was just thinking about is that maybe it's a picture of 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 Mankind's refusal to, in the in the face of of 
of God revealing himself increasingly to be God, that you would think that that would cause us to turn and say, I repent, Mm. I'm sorry, Mm. you know, and submit to his Mm. lordship as God and king, but we don't. And I, I think that's that's fascinating. That makes me think of Pharaoh for sure. Sure, yeah. Because you see this reveal, this like, yeah. God is not only there's not only plagues happening, but God is revealing that He's powerful mm-hmm. and that He is He mm-hmm. is to be worshipped. And you alone. would think, and you, yes, <laughs> yes, and and you could even call that an extension of grace mm-hmm. to Pharaoh. Yeah, um, that God I is. I think that's exactly what He's him. trying to do. Yeah, um, but rather than softening His heart, it hardens it. Mm-hmm. And you see that with a lot of people in the Battle of Armageddon, they're hearts have been hardened to such an extent that they cannot respond Mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Mm. that's interesting when I think about us being these responsive kind of creatures. We were made to respond in in worship, um, Mm. but they become so hardened that they can't. Mm -hmm. They can, yeah. So Mm. really, really interesting to think about how the biblical narrative kind of pulls these things out over and over and over again, like that record player thing you were talking about and mm. this playing to its final yeah. final end, and it did it with the Antichrist, and now it's doing it in the with the hardening of human hearts. Mm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So um, hmm. I think that you have this, you look at the future differently because you, or you look at the present differently mm-hmm. because you know the future. And then the second point in your sermon was you view the future differently because you know the past. Yeah. Is that right? Did I get <laughs> yeah, it right? Yeah, you did. Okay. Okay. Can you, why would someone, um, hmm, why would somebody, What? what's the big deal about mm. Jesus having a, Blood-stained robe. Why? Why is that important to us? <laughs> yeah. So, so the the second point was really about two of the bigger questions that I had um, when reading Revelation nineteen. One is what's with the blood-stained robe, and mm-hmm. two, why does it appear that there's no battle? Um, and, and how to? How, and maybe one ex- explains the other. So, um, yeah, the, the 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 mystery of the blood on the robe is is um, Kind of, there's two answers to this, and you can you could look at it from two different perspectives. One is that it's a reference to Isaiah 63, where it basically describes the Lord returning from uh, Edom, which is the, the enemies of God, and He says, "I've trodden the winepress alone." Basically, He's talking about His wrath being poured out, and that He's working vengeance for Himself, and that He's been, however He puts it, He says that that I've I've trodden them down, these these enemies of my people and my anger, and their lifeblood is on my garments. It's it's splattered on my garments. And which which makes sense when you think about like tr- trotting a wine press. What are you laughing at? I'm just laughing because last week in, in uh, our content meeting, someone said that the Bible is metal or like scripture what? is metal. <laughs> you what do you know mean? Like, I mean? A, like, like a metal song? Like, yes, like. <laughs> That's but great. it makes me think of that, like the blood-stained rope of Jesus <laughs> driving down the white press. Well, like anyway, like a song. Yeah, it, it, so, totally. Sorry. So yeah, you can imagine like like you know stepping on grapes as you would mm-hmm. do, and the juice, you know, splattering up and staining your robe, and that's the description here. He's saying, but that's their blood, hmm. and and so you get this pretty vivid picture, this graphic picture of judgment that that's been happening. Um, and so the reference clearly, like in, in, in Revelation 19, there's a reference to uh, he is, he's what tr- trodden the wine press of the fury of the wrath of mm. the Almighty, God the Almighty, or something like that, that is the, the, the way it reads. And th- yeah, it's like sounds like a total reference to, um, to Isaiah. And so, so the first answer is well, maybe it's the blood of the people that he's about to, you mm. know, that they're going into battle. Maybe it's their blood that he's. Um, God on his robe. The the trouble with that interpretation is that he shows up with the blood already on his robe. Mm -hmm. And before the battle has happened, the blood's already on the robe. Mm -hmm. And I I, I don't know. I I feel like, and this is one of those things about about interpreting scripture that I wished 
more people would do, maybe I might say more pastors would do, which is to allow for ambiguity and say, well, I think it could be this or it could be this, and allow for there to be both uh, options present that you could see it as the blood of, of of God's enemies, or you could see it as his own blood, which is another way to interpret that verse, that it's Jesus coming um, not as a a lion to destroy, but as a lamb who was slain, mm. that this king def- wins by sacrificing himself mm. rather than destroying everyone else. And so he comes with his own blood. Now, I mean, it's it's impossible to get away from the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people dead at the end of this. And and so that, that that's what makes me think it, it must be both. But at any rate, to view it as as his robe being dipped in his own blood reminds me of a verse that you actually brought to my attention, which is Colossians 2, which talks about the, the victory that Christ won, and it specifically refers to him disarming rulers and authorities, the, the, the evil powers, the forces of evil that were aligned against him uh, on the cross. And, and so it makes me wonder if this is both an explanation of, of the blood on the road, but also the, the, the lack of the battle in, in, that, mm. in that he's fighting a group of people who have, in, in, for all practical purposes, have been disarmed before they ever got there, that the battle has already been won, which is why there's really not much of a fight. Mm. So what it tells me is that, that in, you know, theologically speaking, you could say that the battle, that the decisive battle between good and evil has already been won, and that happened at the cross. And that means, I think for us, that then it really does put the future into a certain place, right? Because if I believe that the decisive battle has already been won in the past, then I, then I now can go forward into the future and say, well, I think the future is now certain because of what's happened in the past. An example of this that sometimes gets used is D-Day, whenever... Whenever uh, you know we in, uh, stormed the, the beaches of Normandy, um, the, winning that battle, um, which was a, the the most significant battle in World War World War II, ensured the Allies' victory. Hmm. Uh, it just did. Um, it, it didn't happen then, but it eventually did happen. The fact that we won D-Day meant we were going to win the war. It wasn't a matter of if, it was just a matter of when. But that decisive battle needed to be fought and won. I think that's what you could say about the cross. The decisive battle has been fought and won, though the finish has not yet fully happened. The enemy's all, all but defeated. It's over. Yeah, We're just sort of waiting. So the way I view the past, that's what I was saying, is... The way I view the past gives me a certain uh, a certainty about the future. I yeah. can I can believe that the future will happen as John states it will happen because of what I believe about the past. Yeah, and what you said out of that was that we aren't fighting for victory; right. rather, we're fighting from victory. So, yeah, I have a question. I have a couple of questions about that. Sure. One would be, what's the difference? What would be the difference between a person who's fighting for victory rather than yeah, I from think the victory? angst. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think when you're fighting for victory, there's a there's a sense of, especially when you get desperate. I got to scratch, mm. claw, mm. whatever, climb over whomever to get what I what I'm aiming at because yeah, everything's at stake. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I'm fighting from victory, I can take a loss. I can I can suffer hardship. Mm, interesting. Because I know that the end is secure. I've mm-hmm. already won, so I don't have to panic when when things don't seem like they're going my way in the present. Mm-hmm. I kind of wish I would have talked about that this weekend, but I didn't. Yeah, it's a good thought. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I think that's that's what separates. I mean, I think when I when I think about. Um, just being honest, like what I see, let's say, sort of in the political space and watching Christian people get so worked up over these things, mm-hmm. I think that comes from a lack of, like, I wish we understood a little bit more that the decisive battle has been won. Yeah. It would allow us to endure things that we see that are broken in front of us, mm-hmm. I think, with a bit more, what's the right word? Uh, uh, grace, maybe, yeah. or, or patience. Or patience. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mm-hmm. have to get 
as aggressive. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't maybe be as yeah. mean spirited. Yeah. Um, because I just don't feel. I think so much of our angst comes from the fact that we feel like everything is at stake. Yeah, because yeah. underneath anger is a secondary emotion, mm-hmm. and there's always something else going on yeah. underneath it. And so it sounds like what you're saying is that underneath the anger or the angst or the frustration is a lot of fear. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah fear could be it. Yeah, fear of loss, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, I, if we don't mm-hmm. get so-and-so elected, if we don't whatever – then then this is going to be the outcome. Mm. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, fight for things that we believe in or 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 stand up for things or vote for for things that we believe in or whatever. But I I think the the kind of I don't know the 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 vitriol that comes with all of mm. that and the fact that in certain like we can't have civil conversations. Yeah. Uh, we we to me to me indicates a uh, a fear of loss that goes hmm. uh, that, that that just that belies maybe a, a a lack of confidence in the future. Yeah, I am. It's really interesting what you're saying because you're talking about all things that would be at the antithesis of what a fruit of the, fruit of the spirit oh, would be. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. people who are. Yeah. Yeah, the people who are afraid, they're angry. I mean, those are those are the opposite of what Jesus wants to produce in us. But what you're saying is that when you have this understanding of what has happened in the past and it gives you a picture of what's going to happen in the future, yes. there's something that's produced in us. Yes. That's not anger, and so it's not So this is what fear. you see in Paul. This is it, It's interesting. Do you, do you remember, I forget where it is, you'll probably know, where Paul says, oh, whether I should die or basically mm-hmm. live, I, mm-hmm. I can't say. You know, which, is, which is better, to live as Christ, to die as gain? Yeah, that's Philippians 1, 21. There you are. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great. So, so, but that, think about that sort of attitude toward death. Mm-hmm. Not a laissez-faire, but... A, a sort of I win either way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about Stephen. He's one that we have. Or mm. I mean, Christ being even a. Uh, what do you've got about Stephen? No, no, keep going. <laughs> so I'm when I think about, about Stephen, and I think here's a man being martyred. Yeah, a man being deeply misunderstood. A man who's being, in some sense, betrayed by his own countrymen. Who the very people who should know better and mm-hmm. have recognized the Messiah don't, and now they're killing Stephen. You got to imagine, like I cannot imagine how frustrating that must have been. And yet he's he's, he, I mean, he has some harsh things to say to them, but he handles he that situation with a lot of grace. He just doesn't. He's not yelling. He's not angry. He's not. He just he just goes to his death with a. Sort of sense of calm and and I don't know mag what what's the word magnanimous is the magnan magnum whatever it is nimity I think it is yeah yeah that um yeah that's remarkable hmm. honestly so what are you thinking about Stephen so what's cool is in Acts seven fifty four he's gone through his whole speech and it says now when they heard these things they were enraged and mm, they ground they were their enraged. they ground their teeth yeah. at him yeah but he full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Isn't that interesting? So again, again, and that's so, wow, I wish I would have thought about this. This would have been a great point to teach. Might have made the sermon better. Um, But yeah, I I like this point. So so it's interesting what they're looking at. Yeah, and it says they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and yeah. rushed together. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I just think that's a no. It, it's it's the vision of what it's mm-hmm. the vision of what you see in front of you. Mm-hmm. Stephen sees Christ mm-hmm. seated or standing he's, beside the yeah, throne. Yeah, he's standing, which is very interesting. It's he's Revelation, standing. Yeah, it reminds yeah. me of the Lamb who steps forward in Revelation five. Yeah, standing in that same kind of idea of a resurrected King. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So mm-hmm. here he sees him, and that's what stays him, mm-hmm. calms him through what they're about to do. On the mm-hmm. other hand, they're angry, mm-hmm. grinding their teeth, gnashing their teeth, whatever, stopping their ears. Mm-hmm. It's all this response of, you can feel it, it's like fear of loss, fear mm-hmm. of change, fear mm-hmm. of of whatever. It's like they, they, fear, a loss of control mm-hmm. um, and whatever, and it, it um, 
revealing itself, expressing itself in anger, mm-hmm. immense mm-hmm. anger mm-hmm. and rage. Ah, man, yeah. what's fa- what's interesting about that is I see that like that attitude. I think that's what I think it's a real turnoff to the world, hmm. like to people around us. I think it's a real turnoff when we can't abide uh, when we just seem angry about the way things are going. I, I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. not a fan. I think about too the like how when people do this, they they're most deeply held beliefs are something that they like hold within themselves. Mm. And um, over and over again, it talks about how our it's our faith in the person of Jesus mm. that gives us the ability to overcome and endure. It's not something that we are like um, fearful clutching, mm-hmm. but it's because we've entrusted ourselves and our future to Jesus. And so Mm -hmm. I can't help but think of Colossians 3, where it says, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things Mm. that are above where Christ is seated at the right Mm -hmm. hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden Mm -hmm. with Christ in God. Mm -hmm. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Mm. And so when Jesus is revealed, like everyone who is in Jesus gets revealed along with Him. Mm. Um, We don't know we don't know what we are, or if we don't see ourselves to the fullest extent now, but one day we will. Mm. One day we'll fully understand. Mm. And um, yeah, I think that people who are holding on to this so tightly, um, they're asking for something to happen within their own power that only Jesus can bring to fulfillment. Mm. And um, yeah. I, and I think what we're looking for is to trade the kingdom of God and the future for the kingdom we want mm-hmm. in the here and now. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, a, I think it's a, an attempt to, to create, in some sense, a, a, a kingdom of our own making in the present. And I think we've got to be really careful with such things. So mm. there's a balance mm. to this, right? Where, yeah. where again, like, uh, this is, I'm not saying that we shouldn't advocate for Oh, you know, justice, or we shouldn't advocate for, yeah, um, y- you know, a, a morality or our, our our laws to reflect the morality of the scriptures. Like that, that that would yeah. be something that I think we should we would do well to advocate for. But all the while, knowing that we're that we're exiles, that we're that this is not this is not the fulfillment of what it's incomplete. And so we should expect it to be incomplete. Mm-hmm. When we see the world mm-hmm. broken around us, it, it, this is this is where we live right mm-hmm. now. This is what we're in right now. This is never going to be what we hope it would be. Which I think leads nicely into your third point, mm-hmm. which was we view – what is it? Oh, something is at stake. So we live differently in the present because we know what's at stake. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a priority that clarifies everything else, which you've kind of already talked about. Um, there's a book <laughs> that has a cuss word in the title, <laughs> so oh, I'm not okay. going to say what yeah. it's, uh, I, I'm not even going to tell people what book it is, but I was listening, I didn't read it, but I listened to a summary because I thought it was really fascinating, <laughs> but he was talking about how, um, the way that we prioritize what's, what, the way that we put all other anxieties to rest is to prioritize what's really important, to have something more important Interesting. than our anxiety to wow. focus on instead. And so wow. I think that that is hmm. how we we know what's at stake. Mm. Say more about say more about that. Like how do you what are the important things? What are the things that we should be focusing on right now? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Well I I mean I think it would say um Hmm. I mean, <sighs> yeah, I, I I don't want to act like I don't know, but I'm. That's a big question. It is like, a very big question. Like, what should we be focusing on right now? Yeah. I mean, I think it would be focusing on doing the will of God, but then that that seems like a cop out answer. Mm. And so, um, yeah. I mean, I do think though that you're. If if the will of God, if God wants for us is to love Him and love the brothers, or like First John, that would be what First John would say. Mm. What does it look like? You're yeah, 
to um, love him well and love and love people well as an expression of mm, love. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. So, so, so that, that's a great answer. Yeah. Uh, the, you, thank you. You helped me. So, <laughs> the answer is love God, love people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, what is the great, the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Yeah. So, those two would be. I mean, in summary, I think that's the that's the essence of what it means to truly live. But then how that personally, like how, how like individually expresses itself, mm-hmm. that's going to be a whole different, I mean, they're not different, but they're the specifics of all that are going to be unique to each, each individual. What yeah. does that look like to integrate? Well, I, I think what it, what it most certainly means is that I, I'm not going to live to please myself for mm-hmm. frivolous pleasures uh, all of my life. There, I think Blake was talking about this in our meeting the other day about a John Piper sermon about a about seashells, about this couple who had collected seashells yeah. their whole life, and then they die, and they go before the Lord, and they're wanting to show the Lord their seashell collection. And he's yeah. just like, are you serious right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. there was so much... There were a lot more important things to focus on than seashells. And it does. It kind of brings yeah. a, oh, wow, like, what, what am I investing in? And mm-hmm. what kind of difference... Does it make this? Isn't to say that God doesn't want you to have any hobbies, hmm. but to say to live. I mean, it is amazing the 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 little niches of culture that you can find a whole like subculture of. I mean, just pick anything. You can find a subculture around it. There are message boards. There are people that are. It's it's funny to me. Like in, in any in anything I you know get into, it could be a football team. It could be uh, another sport like Formula One or or motorcycling or whatever. Find you'll find a little world wrapped up around, mm-hmm. like let's say uh, a motorcycle message board. You'll find uh, all these people messaging on there, and then you'll find who the important people are hmm. on that website. You know, they post a lot, and they're mm-hmm. kind of the resident experts. And you have to wonder, like, how many people find a sort of purpose, a de- and a deep sense a of belonging, deep sense of belonging because yeah. they are. Mm-hmm. But I'm the guy on that message board who mm-hmm. kind of, who kind of is running, and it's a small little corner of a tiny kingdom. But you got a kingdom, mm-hmm. and I think, I think there's, I think it's easy to devote yourself to those types of things. That I'm not saying don't be involved in a message board, but I think it's easy to distract yourself thinking that you're really doing something when. Yeah. It, it, what, does it? Does any of that matter? So seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things will be added mm-hmm. to you. In other words, like this is what what really matters is 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 trying to understand, figure out God's will, and then doing that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think what you're saying is if we were to like zoom up over all of what we've talked about today and what you talked about this weekend is that you can't build anything that lasts on fear. Yeah. And if you want to build something that lasts for eternity, you have to start with love. Mm. And you have to start with desiring God's will above what you might decide that you want um, because He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Yeah, I think think that... I, I think what I would say is that you know, I'm. I don't set out to say what what can I do that's going to last for eternity, mm. um, or even or even you know just doing good deeds for other people, but humbly, genuinely showing up before the Lord and saying, "All right, what do you have for me? What's next? Where do mm. where are you sending me?" And and often that presents itself in the form of a step. Uh, some sort of opportunity, some sort of, or the, or the place that you've been planted. A lot of times, at least for me in my life, that was stay where I was at. Hmm. Um, you're not done. You're not done in the crock pot yet. Wait, you know, stay. Hmm. Don't don't leave. And and so it, it, you know, it was through through that obedience that I feel like I've that God worked in me what needed to be worked in me so that I could become who He wanted me to become. Mm-hmm. Um, so God's. Doing something both in you and through you, so that the approach is not to not to set out to say how can I make the biggest difference possible, but really probably more like saying how can I be obedient as possible? Hmm. What is God asking me to do? Hmm. And then and then let Him 
worry about effectiveness and, and fruit. I think that's interesting. So John 15, the idea is abide in me and I in you. And if basically, if you'll abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Yeah. And then my father will be glorified, he says. But the, but the fruit is the byproduct of the, of the abiding. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the key is, is like when you say, what should I focus on? And that question, that stumped me for a second there because I'm like, oh, man, what's, what's, yeah, what does it look like to live a life of purpose? But yeah. I, I think it is really that. It's, it, it is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm-hmm. mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, these two things. Staying close to the Lord and allowing Him to speak to you, shape you, change you, and then, and then, and then trusting Him with the outcome. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I, I think that would—that's what it looks like to live a life of meaning and purpose. All right. Well, this is our last episode in the Tell Me More podcast in this Revelation series. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, We will be back in a couple of weeks to record some new episodes. But in the meantime, uh, enjoy your fall and uh, we'll see you soon.